Next panel is what does the future of the Marine Corps look like in 2030? Um, and it's going to be moderated by Colonel Ike Wilson, who uh, is a, he ran the Commander's Initiative group, group at CENTCOM, deployed to northern Iraq with 101st, where he was a, a chief of plans. Uh, he's a war planner. He's a strategic, uh, he was a strategic advisor in Afghanistan. He's also a, was a professor of uh, politics and, and policy at uh, the Social Department at West Point. He's a visiting professor at George Washington, and not least, he's a fellow at New America. So over to you, Colonel Wilson. Great. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're really privileged today uh, to have the 37th uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Robert Neller, with us. Um, he's going to uh, discuss the future of the Marine Corps. And as many of you already know, General Neller is uh, no stranger to asking hard questions about the future. Uh, nor he, is he a stranger to um, critiquing his own service. In fact, shortly after taking off as his commandant in late 2015, he published the Marine Corps operating concept, which explicitly stated, quote, the Marine Corps is not organized, trained, and equipped to meet the demands of the future operating environment, end quote. So then in an effort to address some deficiencies, he helped oversee the development of a vision for Marine Corps Force 2025, uh, oversaw the creation of Marine Expeditionary Force information groups, the establishment of a cyber MOS, and the development of new naval concepts such as expeditionary advanced base operations. Uh, and he even changed the size of the basic element of the Corps, the rifle squad. Uh, again, it may be a, uh, an understatement to note uh, that not all of these changes were accepted with open arms, uh, quite the opposite in some of these cases. So uh, General Neller, thank you for taking the time to join us again at the Future Security Forum to share your thoughts. Thanks. So I'd like to jump right into the questions. We'll start 30,000 feet and then okay. get down to the, to the nuts and bolts at ground level. So uh, first, sir, um, I'd like to jump right into the discussion by asking, in light of the new strategic guidance, the 2018 uh, National Defense Strategy, how will the Marine Corps adapt for a future characterized by great power competition? You've made some headway over the last few years, but what needs to change moving forward? Well, the strategy is pretty clear for us, and I, I guess the CNO was here earlier today yes, sir. Uh, for the Naval Force. It tells us, uh, well, the strategy tells you increase lethality and readiness, maintain, build partnerships and alliances, and improve the processes of the Pentagon. And it tells uh, the Naval Force uh, to be able to compete in the contact and blunt zone, it tells us who the pacing threat is, and not at the exclusion of other missions. Um, but gives us direction in that. So if you know uh, what you're looking at as a, as a potential adversary, and uh, I think we kind of anticipated that sure. because the Marine Corps has historically been a Pacific-oriented force, although uh, globally employed around the world. So it, it gave us an opportunity to look where we were in the implementation of uh, Force 2025, things that um, we thought were going to be helpful, like the MEF information group and the increased ability to do information operations, in which I include cyber, electronic warfare, and management of the spectrum. And let us look at the other priorities, which is maintain and, and uh, secure and resilient network, improve our ability to long-range precision fires, be able to do distributed logistics, have protective maneuver, uh, and be able to distribute the force across the battle space. So, we're gaming that, we're practicing that, we're rehearsing it. I think we still have some deficiencies and we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, how we are, how we've moved along as far as Force 2025. I think there's still some changes and things we have to make. As I get near the end here, you start to think about all the stuff that didn't get yes. done. Right. I mean, you get nostalgic on one, one hand, which is, you know, mildly interesting if you're sitting around having a bourbon. but. Uh, <laughs> but more importantly, it's like, okay, what do we need to do? And so we're having those discussions now. So um, I'm confident that we'll continue to evolve and adapt this thing. And I think, uh, you know, you're never done. And, but I think in today's environment, your pace of change, not just for technology, but your organizational structure, has got to go faster. You've got to be able to turn uh, faster. And that's, it's, it's not something we do as well as we should. So we'll continue to exercise. I mean, I'll give you an example. So about a month ago, we, there was an exercise called Pacific Blitz on the West Coast. And it was a, a naval exercise where with the Third Fleet and First Marine Expeditionary Force, 
They attempted to replicate some of these expeditionary advanced based ops. They used the naval lift to get ashore, establish a forward army and refueling point. We had aircraft come in and we tried to break it down, move it around, use the sea as maneuver space. And we tried to use pre-positioned shipping and get people out. We actually, but the most interesting thing I think we did because uh, that's not really anything new, it's just new in what we were trying to achieve by it, was we took the, both the third fleet and the one MEF staff and created one staff, Excellent. a blue-green staff. So that's not entirely new, but it's, it's something that doesn't happen all too often, and I think they will we'll realize the benefits of that going down the road. Sir, was that um, innovation on the fly, or is that something you had planned? No, that's something that uh, uh, General Osterman and the Commander Third Fleet kind of worked out on their own. That's fantastic. But, you know, we've been looking at naval integration, and it's more than just trading people on staffs. It's, it's how do we actually operate uh, in, a, in a naval campaign uh, to leverage each other's capabilities. In the past, I think we've... we've we can't, we've, it's been too easy for us to be compartmentalized, and I think now we realize we've got to be, the more and more we're in the same space, on the same comms, the better, the better we're going to be and the more effective we're going to be. So I'd like to riff on this uh, question a, a little bit more here. Um, so what are some of the challenges to modernizing the Marine Corps over the next 10 years? And more specifically, why is, why is change so difficult uh, throughout our forces? You've, you've enjoyed a fair share amount of critique and criticism for some of the recommended changes you've made. Uh, is that just a natural derivative of modernization? You know, I, I think it's just a natural inclination uh, of people that when you tell them you're going to change, they mistakenly ex interpret that, that what they've done was not good. And it has nothing to do with that. It has to do, no, what you did was good. Uh, it, it's just not going to, we just don't think it's going to meet what we look forward to. And you can say, well, you can argue about with the scenario and you say, what's going to happen in 2030? I mean, there's a really good article in the, in the media today, I can't remember the forum, but uh, from Peter Singer about the three things going to happen and how do you do uh, the different types of warfare. And I'm, I, always, I always read everything he writes because I think he's a really smart guy. And uh, I don't know if he's here or not, but yes, sir. I, should, I should get a commission on all the books I've helped him sell. But, uh, but uh, you know, but I, I think uh, actually we are going to do a Marine Corps Cyber Auxiliary, by the way, just for the record. Peter, if right. anybody wants to join, you can sign up. <laughs> you can be our first member. <laughs> you get a T-shirt. You can have purple hair, too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no EGA. <laughs> but um, I, don't, I mean, just, I think it's just a natural order of things. So, uh, but I think as time goes on, and I think as you, as you expose people to things, I mean, a lot of times it's just you don't know what you don't know. I think for me, I went to Singularity University in January of 2015, and I was in a room with a bunch of uh, biochemists and venture capitalists and cyber people, and they were from all over the world. I mean, I was like a Klingon captured by the Federation. <laughs> and, uh, but I sat there for five days, and, and all these very experienced, knowledgeable scientists and subject matter experts came in and talked about energy and biomechanics and additive manufacturing and artificial intelligence and energy, and you just sit there and you go like, wow, I had no idea. So, you know, you have to, you have to kind of open up your mind a little bit. But at the same time, there are certain parts of this, as you know, I mean, you still got to have good people. You still got to train hard. You still have to be disciplined. Uh, at some point in the fight, there may be a time where somebody's going to stand on a piece of ground right. with a weapon in their hand and say, this is mine, you can't have it. Uh, and that We'll see how that all plays out, but you got to get to that point. And to get to that point, you got to have, uh, you got to be able to control your network, deny them theirs, and manage your comms, and be able to deliver your fires accurately in timely manner, which means you have some access to space, and hopefully they don't. So I think everybody, we're training that, and it's happening. Excellent. So let's dig a little deeper and uh, specifically look at uh, future employment of the force, the Corps itself. Uh, knowing the deeply constrained physical environment, uh, perhaps specifically in Europe, uh, but certainly beyond, uh, how will we ensure that allies and partners keep pace with our emphasis on emergent technologies? How do we ensure that our allies and partners retain enough technical capability to provide certain like-for-like -like functional capabilities 
and not be relegated to niche capability contributions in a coalition warfare context? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure you could say the last two years when we've had the highest budgetary levels that we've had a fiscally constrained environment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we'll, we'll try to do the best and spend that money. Now, previous to that, you could make that point, but, and we're hopeful this year that, uh, that the Congress will be able to uh, figure out that they're willing that a way to, to uh, at least maintain a certain level of sustained, uh, reliable funding because that's really what's changing our readiness. Uh, but with our partners, you know, I, I, I think they, there's a recognition uh, on both sides of what, what's, what they can and cannot do, and I think that's fine. I think we have to be more open to what they can do and, and focus less on the other. And I think uh, there's a lot of great capability amongst our allies. Uh, I won't name them, but I mean, whether they're in the NATO alliance or in other parts of the world, and I think we will figure out a way, uh, we figure out a way to, to pass information and communicate. And I think part of that's on us. I think we need to be more flexible with our policies. Uh, I'm not sure we'll ever get away at certain levels of classification where we don't have parallel networks. But I think the, where those networks touch and where we can pass information, I think uh, both sides have to be a little more flexible in doing that. So I, I, you know, today the Commandant General of the Royal Marines is visiting here. Um, we've, we've done a lot of work with the Royal Marines, uh, particularly in, uh, in the European theater. They've helped us in Norway with our cold weather training, and uh, there's going to be other employ deployments where they're going to take advantage of their aircraft carrier, the Queen Elizabeth, and we'll uh, try to support that effort. So we'll work through that, I, but I, I, I'm, I know people are worried about somebody's going to get too far ahead and the other. Um, most of the time, the uniform people can figure out a way to do that, but you've got to bake that in. And I mean, as of as, as much concern is, is that even within the joint force, that we have as much interoperability and we have commonality, and then we have to share that so that people can get on a common ground because we have to be able to communicate. So we'll, it, it's a constant struggle, but I think we, everybody's a recognition, and I think we're moving toward that to try to make it better. So let's shift, shift a, a little bit towards technological nuts and bolts. Uh, into the challenges and opportunities of modernizing the core. Uh, first, I've got a couple of questions in this regard. Uh, first, how is uh, new technology shaping how the Marine Corps operates? How do you envision the Marine Corps working with the established market to enhance its technology? Well, I think communications are probably the first area uh, where we're trying to take advantage of what's out there, whether it's tablets or, or, or different pieces of, uh, so or of hardware and software that allow us to do things faster and better. Uh, the ability we have to buy straight from the market, though, is, is somewhat, uh, there is some friction there based on the rules and regulations we have to do for acquisition. But uh, I think we, we make a very, our best level effort to do that. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I know that artificial intelligence and things like that, obviously autonomy, robotics, manned, unmanned, that's all happening, uh, whether it be ground vehicles or air vehicles or unmanned aircraft. Um, you know, we, there, pretty much every ground vehicle you have can be driven and operated autonomously. Right. I mean, the other day they ran an amphibious assault vehicle up and down the beach, hmm. you know, driven by somebody with a controller. Uh, but, and, and that sounds great until it throws track, and then, you know, the robot can't put the track back on, and the robot can't do security. And, and then you're, I'm going to ask you if you're going to put your, your son or daughter in the back of that thing without a human being, being driving that thing. So there, there's issues with that. But I think unmanned aircraft, uh, under unmanned ships, I know the CNO's got a, a considerable effort there, unmanned undersea vehicles, ability to put, uh, you talk about swarming drones in the air, you can put swarming, swarming drones in the water to go find things and, and find a precision location on them and then if you wanted to potentially uh, remove them. So the autonomy, the robotics, uh, I think that's going to be a player as long as we can figure out how to scale it and get the price down. Um, added manufacturing is a big deal for us as an expeditionary force because if you can make it and you don't have to bring it with you and you're not, you completely untether yourself from the supply chain. So we own about 180 3D printers uh, three of them print and metal. Um, my goal, if I were to stick around, and I'll pass this on to my successor, 
I mean, I think every Marine Maintenance Battalion, of which there are three, and every Marine Air Logistics Squadron, of which there are three, actually there's more than three, there's probably about ten, they all need to be printing in metal in, in less than five years. Because the people that are selling the stuff we're buying, when I talk to them, they're telling me they're printing this stuff. And my question to them is, well, if you're printing it and I can print it, why am I paying you to do what I can do? All right. I'll pay you for the technical data package, which is fair. It'd be kind of like buying music from Apple. I'll pay for the tech data package for the part. And so we've got approval. We're printing, we've got a couple hundred parts, and most of it in polymers and plastics, some in metal that we've got approval and we actually use it, and, and I think as you scale that, that's going to both make your readiness go up, get parts faster, and it's going to save you a lot of money. Uh, so autonomy, robotics, unmanned, unmanned, uh, aircraft, vehicles, printing, there's a lot of stuff going on in the medical field. Uh, as far as anal analytics for large amounts of data for planning or petting information or huge amounts of data, they're going to be... Uh, collected by uh, unmanned aircraft or manned aircraft like the F-35, we're going to need to have an algorithm that's going to look through all that stuff to quickly find it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be buried in this stuff. So uh, this is all happening. Uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, the prior and the current, uh, have got a lot of activities going on. Dr. Griffin's got a lot of money for long-range precision fires, for hyper-velocity hyper weapons, for directed energy, for lasers. All this is happening, and uh, we're testing, and we're, we'll get there because we got to go fast. So you you uh, you mentioned the, the 180 3D printers, and the fact you're producing over 100, I think around 125 ground and 83 aviation parts. Um, you kind of stole my question on that one. Um, I'm very intrigued at how that changes the whole calculation of how we think about or have thought about traditionally about readiness, mm -hmm. and. Um, really in terms of verses, uh, for the most part. A ready for force versus a force for deployed and ready to fight tonight. Uh, it seems like this capability allows us to finally break out of that versus, that supply versus demand, mm -hmm. that whole notion of having the cycle all the way back to home station, um, terra firma here in the United States for quote unquote readiness, and moves us more towards, I think, um, what the chairman's even talked about in terms of combined uh, joint readiness, um, a continuum of readiness. I just wondered what you thought about that. Well, I, I think it was, I think it's kind of intuitively obvious if I can make it, I don't have to, I don't have to put in the requisition. Right. I don't have to wait for it to get sent back. I don't have to wait for the DHL flight if they can get there to arrive. Or if I'm at sea in the middle of the ocean and I can print a part for whatever, uh, I don't have to wait weeks and weeks and weeks. And there's still stuff we have that's legacy and, and it's, there may not be a vendor for it. The people that did that stuff may have gone out of business, but we can still scan it and then uh, and make the part. Uh, so the ground vehicles are easier because if you make something out of metal and it breaks, the vehicle just stops. So if, you, if you make something for an airplane and it breaks, you know, falling out of the sky is really not an, an acceptable option. So there's got to be a metallurgy and there's got to be a quality control and there's got to be a certain uh, skill level there. But, but we'll continue to work that. So we, you know, as in what we found is most successful is get a bunch of young Marines. We have, there's a maker's lab that we have and there's a group of people that help train them and they kind of open their eyes to this stuff and then they start thinking about, well, I can make this, I can make this. So for me, the, the aha moment was, and this sounds, this is really kind of small, but I think it speaks to the potential is, so it was a wet, rainy afternoon in November a couple of years ago and we were on our way home and they go, hey, we're going to stop it at the logistics squadron, the aviation logistics squadron. And, it's Friday, and I said, oh, you know, the Marines, they've been waiting. Okay, so we'll go see them. So I walk in this big kind of van, uh, shipping container van, where they, because expeditionary shelter, and there's this Lance Copel there, and he's showing me that he had printed a, a switch, a knob for a intercom, an intercom. So I'm like, so what's the big deal? I mean, great, great job, Marine. So he <laughs> says, so, so, but what he said was, but so you don't understand is that so the unit of issue, I can't buy this knob. I have to buy the whole plate for the ICX box. And that plate and all that stuff cost me $11,000. I printed this for two and a half cents. I said, make a whole bag of them. <laughs> he says, but I don't have authority to put the knob on. I said, 
No. <laughs> you, you are granted my authority as the commandant of the Marine Corps to put this knob on that switch, on that intercom box. And so, I mean, there's, so we, we've gone back through the naval bureaucracy, naval air, and said, hey, look, and so you've got to go, you, there's a process, but now that process is there. And said, so there's, you know, hey, we want to print this. Marines, hey, can we print this? Can we print this? We want to print this. We want to make this, this tool here, we can print this. So like, whoa. I said, no, I told them to go do this. So now we have to create the process where you, you uh, acknowledge it and you approve it. And so I, I think it's just gonna go, I mean, I, that's how many we've gotten done. That doesn't right. say how many are waiting. Right. Uh, but, but the metal, printing and plastic and polymers, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we make. I mean, I could give you other examples where rather than wait for something simple, we just print it and we just put it on and it's good enough, it works. And if it breaks, okay, there's a bag of them, put another one on. Yeah. But uh, back now, sir. I don't know. It's probably hanging well, inside that. Right. Probably hanging inside that airplane. I hope. <laughs> but uh, but the metal thing is really when you start to print steel, aluminum, titanium, and and other composites, that's when it'll really start to take off. I'm haunted again by my earlier question and a conversation that's really been a common thread throughout all the panels today. And this is this question of whether or not. What about allies? What about partners? whether we are at risk of unintendedly outpacing allies and partners, particularly with this kind of technology, where we can do this within ourselves on the fly. Concerns, any kind of concerns? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, allies and partners along. no, but I think particularly, I mean, for that in manufacturing, not at all, because I think in many cases, uh, many of our partners are ahead of us in the machines that do this, we're buying them from them. So I, I'm not, I, they're, they're more, they're aware of this uh, and they're knowledgeable of this. I think the big thing is probably the command and control and being able to access uh, space and the network and all that and being able to, be, particularly in a classified domain, because that's where those things, as you know, they, they start to rub against each other and people get concerned that, that stuff is going to leak over and then that allow you to get in. Not just from, not from them, but from anybody. Mm -hmm. So the security of the network and is, is a big deal. And so we need to be, you know, we need to be witting to that because to me that's, that's where the fight is going to begin and it could end right there. So I'm going to ask you one more question and we'll open it up to the living room okay. conversation. Uh, and the, um, the, my final question for you, sir, is uh, uh, just let me ask you one more question. Um, and uh, it's this. As you continue to identify, assess, recruit, and train Marines, do you foresee any challenges or necessary changes given the differences in various generations? Will Marines in the future be the same as Marines today? I've actually had young Marines ask me this question yeah. because I think they sense that, you know, obviously they're digitally, they're digital natives and they grew up in a different way. They, they never grew up not knowing what a cell phone was. Right. Uh, they never grew up, uh, the way I grew up and probably you grew up, you know, where you, you had, you know, you had little and expected less. Mm -hmm. And you may do and you figured it out. I mean, they're very adaptive, they're smart. And, but, uh, you know, I, th I think it's, you know, we look at each generation and try to figure out what is their, what kind of makes them do what they do. But at the end of the day, I think, I think it's the same for the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, or the Coast Guard. I mean, if you want, there are young men and women out there, virtue and character, they want to serve. And it's up to us to bring them in, teach them if we need to teach them, or reinforce the values and culture they already have, make sure they understand this is not about them, it's about the team, and that they're not here to make a lot of money, they're here to serve, and they're here to execute orders to the best of their ability, and that they have to be disciplined, focused, and selfless, and you, they have, they're going to constantly be asked to, do, to, to deny themselves. They're going to have to deny themselves. They're going to have to forego what their normal natural inclination is to do something for themselves, for, to do what's right for the good of the group and good of the unit. And I, I think that's, I think that's, uh, I don't think that's impossible. I'm, I'm, I have great confidence. I mean, everybody's worries about, you read the history, uh, what about the next generation? They're not going to, and they always seem to must, run. must step up and do their job. So at the same time, I think it's up to us that we have to set the right example, we have to model our behavior, uh, we have to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk, 
and uh, hold ourselves accountable and along with them. And if we do that, I think we'll be fine. Hoorah, sir. Let's open it up. Just for the record, the soldier said hoorah. So I did. I did, sir. Hoorah. I, I had to practice that for a uh, That was so, very so well done. Today. It's like you get your foreign language credit for that. That's it. <laughs> but not the extra pay. No pay. We don't need any people, more people that speak Marine. Amory. Thank you, Commandant. Thank you so much for coming. I, it, it was a fascinating conversation. So I've, I'm the designated Game of Thrones fan in this audience. I was uh, really disappointed last night. Were you? I was. I was. Why? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, Jon Snow and uh, the Khaleesi flying around in the dark and a dragon. I mean, like, do something, you know? <laughs> All right. Big, big, spoiler, big spoiler alert <laughs> was, going on right now. Look, so, uh, I mean, you know, this is the you last. You know, and another example, if your weather's bad, air support could be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's the line of the day. Uh, but uh, on a more serious note, although it may not sound it, um, you know, Arya Stark is one of the top warriors of the Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And she's absolutely awesome. And I wonder uh, to what extent seeing women like that mm -hmm. as warriors, absolutely as warriors, uh, skilled um, and powerful, to what extent that changes uh, the ability to recruit women and to engage with women uh, in, a, in a core of true warriors? Well, I'm really proud of the women that not just serve in the U.S. military, but particularly those that serve in the Marine Corps. And we've increased the number of women in the last few years to uh, by about 1,600, not to the degree that I wanted to, because um, we're, we're trying to find talent, whoever they might be, the most talented men and women that want to serve. So when, when we went through the process of you know, integration of all units and MOSs, we, we knew there would be a, a phase-in period. And so it's been pretty slow, but the numbers are there. And, but at the end of the day, it's all about standards. So, you know, I think most people know what they're good at and what they want to do. And if that's what interests you to be in a close combat or a ground combat unit um, and you meet the standard, then you'll be given that opportunity to compete and do that job. So, you know, I, you know, there's, there's, I mean, I'm, as I travel around and see Marines, I'm always impressed by uh, all Marines and what they're able to do and their physicality and their motivation and their drive. So I'm, I, I don't, I mean, to me, that issue uh, is not something I, I spend a lot of time on every day. I'm, you know, I'm gonna make sure that everybody's put in the, in the position in the organization where they can contribute the most effectively and where they feel that their talents are being used uh, in the best way. And if they meet the standard, then they, they get the job, full stop. Sir, please. Evening, General Otto Kreischer, Sea Power Magazine. You have made uh, what they mentioned uh, the tough decisions on, on changing the rifle squad, uh, uh, but you had some more, even more difficult decisions in reducing the, your infantry, your O3 grunts, uh, in order to put your manpower into other things cyber, special ops, communications, those kind of things. You know, how's that going? going? Uh, are you getting the people you need in those those skills, and are you seeing any any kickback from from the uh, the grunts on um, downsizing your infantry um, uh, battalions? No, the infantry are the most understanding group in the Marine Corps, so they're fully on board. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's, I mean, we, we still talk about this. Um, but to the real point of the question is, you know, we, we did not know at the time uh, what our end strength was going to be, and we felt that it was critically important that we create these other capabilities, whether it be increased intelligence analysis, whether it be increased electronic warfare, whether it was increased cyber capability, whether it was increased... Uh, uh, information operations and how you're going to leverage the information domain, and there were some other things. So it was a it was a a difficult decision to make, but 
I think now looking back at it, I, I think it was the right one. We'll see in the next 10 years because I think we've seen the, that the battle goes on every day in the information domain, many of which many of you are involved in that, in that contest. So we're always managing risk. We continue to have discussions about do we have too much of this and not enough of this. You know, you're always uh, hedging your bets. So I, I, you know, do we have too much, uh, you know, too many vehicles? Do we need this much lift? Are our vehicles too heavy? Can we get them on ship? How are we going to get them to the fight? So we're always in that kind of give and take. In fact, we had another discussion today about it. So it, it'll never end. And I think as we look at our potential adversaries and see the capabilities that they're building, I think we uh, we got to look at that because if you don't pay attention to what your adversaries are doing and what what they're and you don't learn from them, then you're not going to be a good position if and when you have to compete with them. And we compete with them every day. Gentleman in the back here, please. Thank you. Sir, at the beginning of your remarks, you mentioned how the Marines generally are a Pacific-oriented looking uh, branch. How, would you, how do you describe the Pacific challenge today as opposed to World War II when the Marines sort of made their reputation in the minds of many Americans of that generation? Um, obviously, China is a rising power and Japan is not the adversary any longer, but distances are the same. How would you assess the differences that you're looking at, please? Thank you. I mean, you, the geography is geography. You can't, you can change geography, but in the Pacific, I mean, the fact you've had these huge distances and the geography is very similar to what, what the nation faced in, in uh, 1941. And even some of the places where the Chinese are trying to influence things with the uh, uh, one belt, one road and the network and all the stuff. I mean, it's a very effective strategy where they, where they have operationalized capital to come in and try to influence governments. Uh, that have give them a ge geopolitical position. So it won't be the same. It's not the same. But if you look at the ground and the and the distances out there, there are some comparisons. So I think we're competing out there in that area. I mean, the, the Marine Corps lay down in the beginning of World War II. The Marine Corps was probably very was probably under 50,000. I don't know the exact number. At the end, at the end of World War II, we were 400,000, six divisions and five air wings and. And then after the war went down to about 80,000, and then the strength came back up for Korea, and I can you know, show you this. So the laydown that we came up with, just about two-thirds of the Operational Marine Corps is on the, in the Pacific, working for the commander of indo -Pacom. So that's where the force is. It doesn't mean that's where we have to employ ourselves, but the strategy tells us that's where our focus should be. So we're, we're watching what's going on in all the different places, uh, not just in the Pacific, uh, with throughout the world, and you know you can look at uh, you know there are certain geographical <laughs> choke points. If the part, if the mission of the Navy is to control sea lines of communication, to facilitate commerce, and the safe passage of, of energy and other things, so I think you can kind of figure out where the key points are. And I think the Navy and the Marine Corps are trying to position themselves to where if we had to control those areas or any other area, that we'd have the wherewithal to do that which is what our mission is. Um, Season secure advanced naval bases in the prosecution of a naval campaign, conduct sustained lap, land operations ashore in support of that campaign. That's how you say it. <laughs> Sir. Right here, right here in the middle. Uh, just wait for the mic, please. Thanks. How do you help facilitate the coming home of Marines? And in light of the crisis with suicide? You know, that's a difficult question. Um, so I think at the beginning of OIF, we realized that we didn't really have a plan. And we anticipated a lot of what we learned from other armies, like the, particularly the Israeli army, that there had to be a, a way to bring warriors back or people back who had seen the horrors of combat or had just been through that trauma. And we came up with a program and it was part of a transition, but, and we tried to track those people. And then when you saw other people that we became home with wounds, physical wounds that we could see, and then later on wounds we couldn't see, we created a wounded warrior regiment to try to take care of those Marines, follow up on their care and make sure that they had a lifeline or somebody to call. So fortunately, until a couple of weeks ago, we hadn't had a Marine 
die in combat since 2016. Uh, Staff Sergeant Cardin was killed in northern Iraq, and then we had the three Marines killed in Afghanistan a couple weeks ago. And you saw, I think most people saw the funeral of Staff Sergeant Slutman up in New York City. He'll be buried at Arlington tomorrow. Um, the suicide that we're experienced, that we're having now, uh, is, is very different. And I mean, I'll put the veteran suicide over here on the side. But uh, last year, we had uh, the highest number of Marines take their own lives was 58 in the active force and, and another 18 in the reserve force. And the great, great, great majority of those Marines have never deployed. That doesn't mean they didn't have trauma, they didn't have something in their lives. And so we're, we're trying to figure out uh, where we now, you're never going to have enough mental health capability, but we have probably the greatest amount of mental health capability we've ever had. We've set up, uh, tried to train the force to be to be aware of this, try to encourage people to seek help, try to make people understand, you know, what's going on. Uh, but we're still having a hard time. And so I'm, I'm, of all the stuff that's happened since I've been in this office, that's probably one of the ones that's the most frustrating to me. Because, uh, you know, and, and again, uh, I can profile it, I can give you reasons, I can explain it to you, but it doesn't change the fact that, that it is, it's still an issue. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue to work on it. Uh, but if, if, there's, if there were a, a, s a specific answer, then the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps would have found it, we would have implemented it. Sir, and then. Sir, good afternoon. George Nicholson of the Special Operations Forces Foundation. A little over a year uh, ago, you were the Atlantic Council. And you stood up and you said the biggest threat the Marines face in the future is the dependence upon GPS and SATCOM. And you alluded that you had been in Afghanistan the month before and asked one of the Marines you were driving around with to show you something on the map. And they said, we don't use maps anymore. We've got smartphones and we've got, got tablets. Uh, there was an earlier panel here on the, uh, what the U.S. military will be doing in space in 2030. What's your comfort level about what's being done to solve your concern and question? Well, first of all, I, if you went to the field and saw a Marine unit, if they didn't have a map in their pocket, I'd be pretty upset. Because we're, we're operating and training, at least our major exercises, on the assumption that the network is likely not going to be there or it's going to be intermittent. Or worse, it's not reliable. In other words, what you see is not true. That's, to me, the biggest threat. It's up, it looks normal, but it's off. And... Uh, so I, I think the creating a, I mean, we, there is a space command, it's part of STRATCOM now, uh, to emphasize this, to understand that the, the priority of space is the ultimate high ground, I think that's a good idea. I think we need to be more active in being able to protect the satellites and put a new constellation up there and quickly establish more communication satellites if, they are, if they're lost for whatever reason. But I think everybody realizes that this is the number one issue for the Department of Defense, is a reliable, resilient, recoverable network. And we all accept the fact that it's, gonna, it's not going to be there 100 percent like it's been the last 17 years because there's been nobody to contest it. There will be in the future. At the same time, you still, if you lose a network, you're, you're, you can't just stop and throw your hands up. You know, you've got other means to communicate. You've got other means to navigate. And I, there's other ways to deliver a precision munition other than with GPS or to find your way or to drive or get your timing. And, uh, you know, if we got to go to HF radio and paper maps and yellow stickies and messengers and, land, and landline and wire, uh, then we'll do that if we have to. But that... Hopefully, if we have to do that, we've done the same thing to the other guy. And in, in the adversary, we're fighting on a level playing field. But to me, that's, that's going to be the first salvo of whatever competition there is. I mean, that, that goes on. If, I'm not going to speak for General Nakasone, but if he were here or any of his folks, he'd tell you that fight's going on every day, every second right now. One more question. Ma'am. General, I'm Sharon Burke from New America, and 
trying to figure out the right way to ask this question. You mentioned China's Belt and Road Initiative and their geopolitical positioning and that it's a successful strategy. Um, the national defense strategy is really focused on lethality and on great power competition. And where does the Marine Corps and the Department of Defense fit in our overall strategy? And I say this advisedly with, you know, down the hall from us where we're sitting right now is the Agency for International Development, mm -hmm. which is losing people and consumed in a reorganization. State Department's in the same kind of condition. We're What's our strategy? How do we? How does the Marine Corps fit into a broader strategy with the focus on lethality these days? Well, I, remember the strategy has three parts. The first is increase lethality and, and, and readiness of the force. The second one is build and maintain alliances and partnerships. And you can't do that unless you're out there with your partners, building new partners, maintaining the alliances and partnerships you have. And you do have to do that by being physically present. And obviously, the interagency piece is part of that. But for the military. You know, for the naval force, we, we see ourselves in the strategy talks about the contact force, which is out for deployed, postured. And so we're out there every day training with our allies, moving through the battle space. Uh, the adversary sees us. Uh, we're out there competing with them below the level of conflict, trying to ensure that our allies understand we're going to be there. They can trust us. They can be reliable. And the economic piece is something that we work with the embassy on. So, it could, so it's not just, it can't just be the, the M and dime, it's got to be the diplomacy, the information, the economy. So we're all about increasing the capability of whether it's USAID or people doing Peace Corps or anything else out in the, in the area. But at the same time, you know, we may be able to create an entry point there or go there along with other American agencies. So in the South Pacific, for example, throughout Oceania, Micronesia, all those islands, uh, we probably could use a little more coverage, a little more help. But, you know, we're out there, uh, Admiral Davidson's out there working to try to get us into all these places we haven't been because we know that others are going to go there and, uh, and they're going to try to influence the action. And we, we, we can't just uh, rely on our goodwill, goodwill and the fact that people probably would like to work with us uh, more than others uh, if you don't have something to provide them, whether it be rebuild the school, fix the power grid, pave the road, increase the depth of the port, uh, improve the airport, uh, whatever it is. You got to do something. Uh, and I think, there's, I think there's clearly a recognition within a department, I think within the government, that that's where we need to go. And not just our government. I think it's with our partners throughout the Pacific and throughout the, the, in NATO and other places in Africa. We can't be everywhere. Uh, so we have to be very specific on where we go and, and uh, focus on those places where are critically important to us. But at some point, I mean, the, the, you mentioned the Chinese. I mean, they are expanding. And at some point, though, you, if you get too big, you potentially could create your own vulnerabilities. But uh, we'll see what happens. But I, I, I'm, I'm confident that there's a recognition uh, within, the, within the government that that's where we need to go. And then just like, you know, I don't think anybody in the military wants to see a reduction in any of the what you would call soft power things, because that's really uh, what we, at the at the end of the day is going to help keep us from going to war, which is our ultimate goal. And so with that, we are out of time. Please, everyone, join me in thanking the commandant. Uh, thank you.